Do not try blind chicken therapy. We sat in a circle and shared our innermost thoughts. Torturous, asinine, intrusive thoughts. A fear of contamination from a strand of her hair. A fear that one day, in a fit of insanity, he might murder his loved ones. A fear of cheating on her partner while sleepwalking. Each OCD sufferer had a unique theme, but we were all the same. We all feared the unknown. And what about you, Zeke? Denny asked. Denny was the facilitator for the support group, and I unwillingly resented him. I loathed myself for that, given that he was such a lovely bloke. He was a sufferer like the rest of us. Except he wasn't like the rest of us. Denny had successfully controlled his disorder, something that the rest of us hadn't achieved. I shrugged. Same as always. Don't feel like talking today? Denny pressed. <sighs> I sighed, swallowing my aggression and speaking through gritted teeth. Why bore everyone? I have nothing new to say. Existential dread rules my daily life. I still find myself not wanting to wake up. I still perform magical compulsions because I fear an unknown deity that determines my every move. Though the logical part of my brain knows that deity to be no more than my mental illness. But being self-aware doesn't mean anything, does it? We're all self-aware. Yet, we're all still sick. Exposure and response prevention only seems to work for you, Denny. It's an uphill battle, Zeke. But you can do this, Denny assured me. You're fighting so hard. You don't have to push yourself beyond your ability, you know? Most of the people here are just trying to cope on a daily basis. It's okay to not be okay, I finished, sighing. I appreciate the sentiment, Denny, but I'm tired. Tired of living with this disorder. I don't want to do compulsions anymore. I don't want to just cope. I want to be like you. I want to get better. But how? How did you do it, Denny? The ever-kind, ever-robotic facilitator placated me with platitudes. And I felt unheard, as always. The remainder of the two hours ticked by painfully slowly, and at the end of the session, I slumped towards the doorway with my disheartened companions. But before I left, Danny surprised me. Zeke, will you give me a minute of your time? He asked. I stepped to the side, allowing the last of the support group attendees to leave. Then he closed the door behind them. Let's sit down for a second, he said, motioning towards the empty chairs. I raised an uneasy eyebrow, but followed the unusually somber facilitator to the circle of seats. I found myself staying out of curiosity. I'd never seen the man without a smile on his face. He looked as if he were about to deliver the worst news of my life. And as it would happen, I wasn't too far from the truth. What's up? I asked. You're very determined, he said. The others just want an easy fix. A plaster for the wound. They don't want to even try exposure and response prevention. But you've tried ERP, haven't you? You've tried exposing yourself to your fears and preventing responses. I nodded. Every day, Denny. The fear just morphs its face. There's always a new existential dread. There's always another unknown. ERP is the gold standard treatment, Denny continued. But that doesn't mean it works for everyone. I'm going to tell you something, 
Zeke. It didn't work for me either. And I tried. Oh, I really tried. No, it was another route that led me to this place. How desperate are you, Zeke? I frowned. Uh, I'm desperate. But what did you do, Denny? Something that changed me forever, he replied. Blind chicken therapy. I tried to stifle a laugh. <laughs> S sorry, what? Well, you know the, the, the game, chicken, Denny asked. Running across a road, trying not to be flattened by a car. Yeah? Yeah, I started. Well, uh, blind chicken therapy it involves doing that blindfolded, he said. I stopped smirking. Uh, that doesn't really seem like something a facilitator should be recommending to a sufferer at a support group. No, it doesn't, does it? Denny replied. Well, you shouldn't be recommending any kind of medical treatment. So, maybe we forget this conversation, then I go home, I said, standing up. Denny abruptly rose too. I was in a dark place, Zeke. A very dark place. You know what I mean. I know you've tried ending things. Well... I nearly took my life, and part of me thought that playing chicken might end with me dying, but it didn't, and something amazing happened, Zeke, something terrible at the same time, oh, it, it worked, it really worked, my fears stopped taking hold, uh, I'm gonna Go, I said slowly. At this point, I was worrying for the man's state of wellness, and I'm ashamed to say that it gave me a little satisfaction to see him squirming for once. Not so perfect after all, are you? I thought. It's real, Zeke, he said. And I don't want you to reach the end of your tether, too. I don't want you to try and take your life again, I... I want you to survive. Then why on earth would you suggest something as horrible as chicken? I exasperatedly asked. Fools die playing that game. You should know that. I do, Denny hoarsely croaked. But if you play blind chicken, if you do it properly, I mean, it changes you, Zeke. I don't know how to... Uh... Look, I still have intrusive thoughts, but they come and go with the wind. My OCD doesn't even exist anymore. That's impossible, I said. There is no cure for this illness. Therapy and treatment, sure, but no cure. Well, I found one, he insisted, and it worked. Don't you want to at least try? Better to meet your end trying to find the light. You know? I felt deeply sickened by that final sentence. What a disgusting notion. And what sickened me the most was that I was swayed by it. Running across a road blindfolded, I said. That cured your fear? Yes, Denny said. And how did you discover this miracle treatment? I asked. A, a fellow sufferer did the same thing, he said. I called him crazy too, but like you, I had nothing left to lose. That's a cruel thing to say, I scoffed. It's not a lie though, is it? Denny asked. I didn't reply. Listen, he started. 
appearing serious and sullen once more. It's not... It's not some placebo effect. It's not about achieving euphoria through an adrenaline rush. Something happens. <sighs> I sighed, still believing the man to be insane. What do you mean, Denny? I mean... Things happened afterwards. Uh, things... I still don't know how to explain. Like what? I asked. I, I don't know, Zeke, he said, turning paler by the second. No, 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 no. Th this was wrong. I, I shouldn't have suggested anything. Oh, okay. Is this reverse psychology? I asked. All part of the therapy? Denny shook his head. No, I, I was stupid to tell you about this. I try to forget about what happened, and it's all over now, as long as I live in my bubble. Look, just go home, Zeke. No, screw you, I said. You don't get to mess with my head. You of all people should know that I already have a scrambled brain. I'm doing it. Why did I decide to play the man's unhinged game? Was it out of spite? Perhaps. However, I also felt it calling to me. The prospect of a way out. A life without existential OCD. A life of certainty. But that isn't what I found. Zeke, please, Denny begged. The man followed me out of the building, and we walked through the busy town on a bitter autumnal evening. He anxiously watched as I fashioned a blindfold out of the scarf. This is your fault, Denny, I said. You were right. I'm a desperate man. The man floundered. I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry I put the idea in your head. I was lying, okay? It's not real. There is no such thing as blind chicken therapy. <laughs> Why would that make any difference? Look, I'm sick, alright? I'm, I'm still sick. No, you're not, I said, more certain than I'd ever been before. I stepped towards the edge of the main road, and I theatrically tightened the scarf around my head, secretly relishing in Denny's panic. Screw that guy, dangling a carrot before snatching it away. Well, I wouldn't let him. Once I'd blinded myself, the late night traffic loudened, became more fearsome to my attuned ears. There was a constant roar of mindless machinery that threatened to grind my guts into the asphalt. Terror filled my body like a poison balloon. Uh, you're really going to do it, aren't you? Denny cried. Yes, I replied. Are you going to guide me? No, that's not how it works, you... It's about embracing uncertainty. And you need to do it properly, he said. In order for Blind Chicken to work, it must be a busy road. A dangerous road. Uh, I think we found one of those. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, you need to focus on your theme of fear. Your existential anxiety. Really focus on it. This is sounding like superstitious nonsense, Denny, I said. Good, then don't do it, the man pleaded. The rational part of my brain told me that Denny simply feared for my physical safety in the face of oncoming traffic. But some other part of me, a primal, unthinking part, told me that something else lay at the heart of his frightened voice. For a man that's overcome his fear... You sure sound afraid, I said. I'm not afraid of my intrusive thoughts, he whimpered. I'm afraid of something you see when you reach the other side of the road. I'm not allowed to tell you. There's a price to pay, Zeke. And you'll move past it, but stop being so cryptic, I said, 
Just tell me what happened. I... J just believe me, Zeke. I shouldn't have told you about this. It was a moment of madness. I was being selfish. I was thinking about how good my life had become. But horrible things happened for me to get here. Don't make me say it. You don't want to endure what I endured. I want what you have, Denny, I said. Even if I had wanted to stop, I don't think I could have wailed my way back to the pavement. After taking a couple of steps into the road, a deafening truck horn sounded. I quickened my pace, tuning out the sound of tyres scorching the road beneath my feet. I had never felt such fear. A very real fear, unlike the kind that usually plagued my ill mind. Every yard felt like a mile, and the truck horn was swiftly joined by a cacophony of equally deafening car horns. I heard the sound of metal biting into metal, a guilt that I carry with me to this day, and though I know it only took seconds for me to reach the other side of the road, it was a journey longer than words can describe. A darkened journey, only of sound, but my ears told the story, and when I removed my blindfold, I was faced with the scene of carnage. Fortunately, the driver of the delivery truck and the partially crumpled BMW were both fine, though it could quite easily have been a different tale. But they had abandoned their vehicles and were beelining towards me. Denny had vanished, and I was left to contend with the consequences of my actions. Did I feel fearless? A brave new man? Not at all. I sprinted from my victims, heart thumping rapidly. I managed to outrun them, and half an hour later, I found that I'd somehow travelled the entire way home on foot. I was severely winded once the adrenaline wore off, and I deeply regretted the events of the evening. My illness had taken me to a new low. I was no longer only endangering myself. And as I fell into bed, racked with shame, I thought I might never fall asleep, but I easily soothed myself, and I was quickly enveloped by a swift wave of blackness. The superstition of a madman. That was what I told myself. I'd been conned. When I woke the next morning, I was furious. I'd nearly thrown away my life and the lives of many others. It wasn't until I got to work that I realised something. My thoughts weren't sticking. I hadn't performed a single compulsion. I'd already experienced a thousand existential thoughts by 10am. Thoughts that would usually instill me with a deep fear. But they hadn't. And it wasn't the adrenaline. No. I'd experienced trauma before. My mother dying. A vicious beating in my youth. Stress exacerbates OCD. And makes one susceptible to intrusive thoughts. But I found myself viewing these ideas as amusing noises. Tap eight times to save yourself from an eternal hellscape. Touch that wall in the right way to stop your girlfriend from dying. Go through your safety mantras. Thoughts that would usually rattle around in my brain for hours. Thoughts that would only go away after I performed a compulsion. However, that wasn't happening. My brain was different. It wasn't interested in the thoughts. It wasn't anxious. This was no placebo effect. I had a new mind. Denny had been telling the truth, just as I'd suspected in the pit of my gut. Blind chicken therapy worked. I rang the facilitator, half expecting the man not to answer. Feels good, doesn't it? He whispered before I had a chance to speak. I gasped tears forming in my eyes. <gasps> it's, is this how normal people feel? 
I don't know, Zeke. But I think you need to- Oh, boss is coming over. I'll talk to you later, I said, hanging up abruptly. No calls, please, Zeke, Randy said. Or was it one of your compulsions? The short, rotund man squinted at me with beady, uncaring eyes. I regretted disclosing my illness to my employer, but I did so under the impression that the company would make reasonable adjustments for my disability. You'd love to fire me, wouldn't you? I thought. You're just waiting for an excuse that won't be viewed as discrimination. No, it was somebody from my support group, actually, I said. Randy nodded, looking visibly disgusted by me. Right, wait for your lunch break next time, please. No calls to the psych ward during work hours. <gasps> A co-worker audibly gasped, and I found myself tightly gripping the edges of my desk. Got you now. I thought, I'm going straight to HR. But I didn't say that aloud. I just nodded my head and continued working. Yet, the room felt strange after that. Colder. Darker. I glanced up from my screen, feeling the hairs on the back of my neck stand upright. Something was wrong. I eyeballed Randy through his office window, and that was when I saw it. A shadow hung over my barbaric boss. It painted the walls of his office, and for a fleeting moment, it looked like a man. A man with shriveled, ever-growing arms, reaching towards Randy. In one hand, it held what looked like a syringe, and in the other, it held a phone. I opened my mouth to screech, but I was too horrified to utter a sound. And then Randy looked up from his desk to see the shadow detaching itself from the wall. A black inspector, in the shape of a doctor, stood in the middle of the room. Body too large, movement crooked and unnatural. My boss screamed piercingly as the entity raised the syringe and rapidly plunged it into the man's forehead. As Randy started to convulse, the wretched thing held out the phone in its other hand. I heard it ringing. Every worker in the room shot their eyes to the office window. But the spectre was gone. Randy was sitting with his head rolling from side to side on the back of his chair, eyes wide and unseeing. Paramedics arrived to take him away, and Randy was babbling incoherently. Work hours, work hours, no, no calls to the ward, no, no, no. My throat closed. I watched, pale-faced as our unhinged boss was taken away. And after a brief stint in the hospital, he was committed to a local psychiatric ward. Petrified doesn't even begin to describe how I felt. I had ignored Denny. He'd warned me that I would pay a price for cheating fear itself. And I ignored him. Well, he started to ignore me after that no answering my calls, and we ended up with a new facilitator at the support group. I stopped going, eventually. Not only due to the fact that I'd overcome OCD, no, something else happened. I washed my hands, Dad said. Huh? I asked, absent-mindedly watching the motorway ahead. Before touching the sandwich, I know he used to reject food if I'd touched it with unclean hands, he continued. But you're driving anyway, so... No, it's... Uh, it's fine, I said, taking the sandwich with a spare hand. I, uh... I actually stopped caring about contamination a long time ago, Dad. Yeah, right, right, Dad said. It's, uh... It's a fear of God now, isn't it? Well, uh... Existential dread, I said. Yeah, 
Yeah, that. He nodded. You know, uh... I've been feeling better. I whispered, almost choking on the words. Really? Therapy is working, eh? Well, I'm glad to hear that, kiddo. You've come so far. You know, I remember when you were six, uh... That time you threw up. Remember that? Yeah, lovely story, Dad, I said. Well, that was how it started, wasn't it? He asked. You became so scared of becoming sick after that. A metaphobia. Fear of throwing up. Yeah, that's right, I remember. You were always washing your hands. And then it progressed to other fears, didn't it? Weirder fears. Dad, I pleaded. <laughs> I'm just saying, he chuckled. Look, I'm proud of you, Zeke. And Mum would be proud of you too. Thanks, Dad, I said. Let's drop it, okay? Okay, he smiled. Here's to not fearing vomit, eh? <clears throat> no. <coughs> it all happened so quickly. My father made an unearthly sound, as if he were choking on something sharp and painful. I glanced over at him. Dad? He shook his head. He couldn't speak. My father was clutching his throat. No, clawing at his throat. Dad? I repeated. Skin and blood collected under his fingernails but it hadn't started yet. I swerved in the road. Unwilling to endanger anyone again, I quickly pulled onto the hard shoulder. My father projectile vomited a dark, unidentifiable substance. <laughs> a never-ending substance. My eyes widened, and I found myself, once again, unable to voice my horror. Unable to move or do anything to help him, I simply shook, with my hands gripping the steering wheel as my father unleashed an incessant stream of black bile onto the dashboard, his face turning redder and redder, his teary eyes locked onto mine, and all signs of life slowly faded from his body. Unable to breathe, clogged with vomit, he eventually collapsed forwards. The stream of bile ceased. Dad! I cried again, finally able to speak. I unclipped my seatbelt. Whatever force had seized me, it finally released me. Not that I would have been able to save my father anyway. Denny's cautionary words finally made sense. And as I stood at the side of the motorway, staring at my dead father, ignored by passers-by, I was consumed by uncontainable rage. Denny did this, I thought. I didn't call emergency services. I called my old facilitator once more. He didn't answer, of course, but I left a voicemail. You ruined my life. I muttered. You may blame me, but you did this to me. I hung up the phone, plummeted to the grass, and attempted to cry. But I was empty, devoid of emotion, stripped clean of all feelings by blind chicken. I was sitting at the end of the world, Nothing left to lose, Denny had said. Well, that was true. And after everything, what I did not expect was for my phone to suddenly ring. Play the game again, Denny said. If you want it to stop, you need to play again. I'll kill you, I whispered. What is this thing? I saw a shadow, I... I do I'm sorry, Zeke. I don't have the answers, Denny whispered. The only way to undo it 
is to repeat what caused it. Then my dad would have died for nothing, I spat. Now, to honour him, it needs to have meant something. After all, it's... It's got to be over now, right? You said it ended eventually. I lied. It doesn't stop. It never stops. It'll always hurt those around you. I only made things better by living life carefully. I stopped talking about my OCD to people. That's what feeds it. Why do you think I was always so chipper at the support groups? Why do you think I never talked about myself? But I... I haven't been brave enough to truly stop it. I haven't been brave enough to play the game again and, and do everything. You don't want to live like me. Isolated. Alone. <laughs> you don't want me to live a terrible life. This is deja vu, Denny. That's exactly what you said before. That's how you convinced me to do this in the first place. Look, I've told you what you need to do to fix everything. I'm sorry, Zeke. The man hung up before I replied. And I was back at the start. Standing at the side of a busy road with a choice. But I'd already made my decision. Bandaging my eyes with my scarf, I found myself ready to try blind chicken again. Haunted by my mistakes, I truly wished that I wouldn't make it to the other side. That a car would end my misery for good. As I stepped forward, blind to the world... I heard the screeching of tyres, the blare of horns, and the thump of metal bodies colliding. I broke my promise to myself. I was selfishly endangering others once more. But I had to do this. I had to stop the fear from taking any of the lives. I reached the barrier in the middle of the motorway, almost tripping forwards, and I gently clambered over it, traversing the other side. Tire screeches and horns continued whilst I pressed onwards, trying desperately to endanger as few drivers as possible. I was, in equal measure, relieved and terrified to find my feet reaching the sturdiness of a grassy embankment at the other side of the road. I'd succeeded twice at Blind Chicken, but I knew what that meant. As I removed the blindfold, I felt a weight descend upon my shoulders. Intrusive thoughts swarmed my mind, and an old enemy returned. Anxiety. But I was surprised to find that I embraced fear with open arms. Finally, after thirty years of fighting, I accepted it. Fear isn't something I'll ever conquer. But I don't have to conquer it. I just have to let it be. Learn to coexist. Desensitize myself. Stop wrestling with the thoughts. And after being cursed by an entity I'll never hope to understand, I've learned something about my particular theme of existential supernatural fear. Unknowns are okay. I don't know what cursed me. But I still beat it. I still came out the other side. No matter what my brain tells me, I can survive fear. <laughs>